mercy, my Savior, with love in his eyes, and his body broken, and no sin to hide. I see my Jesus. Eyes blind with blood And his face is crimson And his cry is love No wonder we call you Savior No wonder we sing your praise
Hey, what's going on, Grid family? Hope you're doing well today. Grab your Bible, open to the book of 2 John. If you missed last Sunday, we concluded our 1 John, uh, the book of 1 John, and we're going to continue our collection through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John through 2 John today. And we're going to be looking at the entire book. It's only 13 verses long, so grab your Bible. Uh, I've entitled today's talk, When Your Hospitality Welcomes Heresy. When your hospitality welcomes heresy. And uh, we're going to jump right into it because we're going to cover the entire book, all 13 verses. So we're going to jump right in. But just by way of intro, John spent the entirety of First John dealing with the topic of heresy. These heretical false teachers and preachers who were traveling about and spreading false doctrine, the gospel, gospels that weren't actually the gospel. And so now John is continuing that very same um, kind of line of thinking, but he's addressing a very specific person in the church that he is writing to. Specifically, he's talking to a lady. And so we're going to jump in. Second John chapter, well, there's only one chapter. Second John, verse number one says this, the elder, that would be John, um, to the lady. To the lady. How I mean, how sad. Like you're mentioned in the most popular book in the entire Bible, and you don't even get a name. You're just called the lady. To the, the elder, to the lady, chosen by God, and to her children, whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be in us forever. Now we gotta answer the question: who is this lady? Who are her children? Like what? Like they're, they're quite honestly, there's a lot of debate, or there, maybe I should say there was a lot of debate as to why this letter, just 13 short verses, was included in our Bible, right? Like what? It appears to be like a personal letter to a lady, a specific lady in a church, and so we're like, why? Like why couldn't John just like send her a text message, right? Like her, or or shoot her a voice memo? Or, you know, like, why couldn't he, you know, obviously they didn't have that back then. I know that. I get it. You know, send me nasty emails. I get it, right? But he could have, like, that, like, why is this included in our Bible, right? And I think as we get into the letter, the implications and what he's addressing specifically to one person, it can be translated to the entire congregation of believers. And quite frankly, it can be translated to the entire global church at large for all time. And so that's kind of why this letter is included in our Bible. Now we got to deal with the lady. Who's the lady, right? Like the, this lady, she didn't have a name. We don't know her name. I mean, she did have a name. We just don't know it. She was believed to be a widow in the church. Her husband had passed away, but she had kids, right? And they were, they were involved. They were ingrained in the life of the church. They were there Sunday morning, a Sunday night. They were there Wednesday nights. They were there for Revival Fridays. They were there for Sanctified Saturdays. They were there every chance they could possibly be there. They were there. They were at church. They were ingrained. They were involved in the life of the church, believed to be a widow in the church, but they were also known, this lady was known for her hospitality. Like every church has the hospitable ones, right? Like the people that throw the best dinner parties, they have you over, they're warm and they're welcoming and they just have a gift of hospitality. Like uh, here's a great example. When we were hired on in our first ministry position, we were moving Britannica and I were moving from Springfield, Missouri to Joliet, Illinois. That's where our first ministry position was. And we were going to a church. Um, you know, it was a it was a medium sized type church, but there was there was a couple in the church that were they were known for their hospitality. So we're moving. We have no home. We we were hired part time, so we don't even have full time income. We we have like we have a car, and like we were just kind of putting all of our stuff into our storage unit because the church was like, you know what? Why don't you just move here, right? And like you can stay with a couple in our church, and we're like. Okay, we don't know them, but okay. I mean, I, they go to church, so they can't be that bad, right? So they're the hospitable ones. So we go, and they're and they're like, you know what? You guys can. We start talking with them. They're like, you guys can stay in our basement. Now imagine, imagine the conversation. How that went with my with my bride, who we've only been married for a year. We accept our first ministry position. Like big life changes happening. I'm like, hey babe. So we're gonna move to a place we don't know, where we know no one, and we're gonna live in someone's basement, and we just kind of hope they don't kill us. What do you think? Are you in? <laughs> That's kind of what it felt like. Well, come to find out, this was one of the most hospitable couples we've ever met to this day. 
to this day, right? Like they had an amazing home, an amazing finished basement. They gave us our privacy. They allowed us to kind of take over their basement. And I mean, it was great. I mean, it had like, it had a room, had a living room, had everything we needed, bathroom, kitchen. We got everything we need down in this basement. And we were able to stay there for a couple months until we found a place of our own, until we kind of learned the area and figured out where we wanted to live. So we did that and they were known as the hospitable ones. That's who this lady is. She's just known for her hospitality. You got a need, go to her. You want somewhere to stay, go to her. She's got tons of kids, doesn't matter, go to her. Like she is the hospitable one in the church. What we're gonna come to find out is that this particular lady would sacrifice the truth for her hospitality. In an effort to be hospitable and loving and welcoming, she would sacrifice the truth of the gospel. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? Well, in that day, just like today, we would have missionaries traveling around or evangelists traveling around. Same thing in their day. They would have itinerant missionaries or itinerant evangelists traveling around from town to town to preach. Now, most of these, well, I would say most, but a large percentage of these itinerant missionaries and evangelists were false teachers. They were spreading lies. They were talking about things that weren't the gospel. They were preaching things that were that were contrary to the word of God. And this lady would welcome those people into her home. Hey, you're a false teacher. You're preaching a false gospel. You're preaching a different gospel. Doesn't matter. You can come and you can stay in my home. And her hospitality was coming at the sake of truth, was coming in and compromising the truth. And what's John's point here is that by outwardly accepting or by silently ignoring that which is false is the same thing as stamping your approval upon it. You're an itinerant missionary who's preaching a false gospel. I don't care. You can come and stay with me. I'm going to give you a place where you can lay your head and you can rest and you can go out the next day and continue to spread your false gospel. And that's what this lady was doing. Her hospitality was compromising the truth. And what I found is this, is that true love should never Never violate truth, but true love should uphold the truth, right? Like this is what God has called us to, to uphold the truth of scripture. And here's quite frankly what's happening in our day today is that in the name of love, and in the name of acceptance, because isn't that the mantra of our day? Just love me. Just accept me as I am and my belief system, although it may be contrary to the word of God and all these things, just love me and accept me. We've got far too many Christians in the name of acceptance and in the name of love, just simply approving of the life of sin that these people are living in by our silence or by our outward acceptance of it. This is what's happening in our day and age. And John's point is this, if the love that you are showing people and the acceptance that you are showing people is causing you to violate or to compromise the truth in your own life or in anybody else's life, it is not true love. And in fact, you are taking part in the wickedness that they are living in. This is John's point. We're gonna to come to find out, like I'm not making this up. This is scripture. Our job is to truly love people by upholding the truth, not by sacrificing the truth, not by enabling them to continue to live in the lifestyle they, they're living in or to continue to preach the gospel that they are preaching, especially, now let me make this clear, especially in the church, because John is addressing the church. He's not addressing people outside the church. He's not suggesting that you should go be the bullhorn person, right? Like, turn or burn, <laughs> get your life right. Lusty, lusty, you're gonna turn into dusty, right? Like, he's not... Uh, he's not advocating for this idea that you should go and be that bullhorn person, right? That's not what he's, he's saying that within the confines of the church, within the body of believers, it is our job, it is our mandate to uphold each other, to uphold the truth in each other, to keep each other accountable. And if there's someone preaching, if there's someone uh, not even preaching from the pulpit, but preaching in a grid group or preaching in a setting that is church related, that is preaching something other than the gospel, it is our job to call that out and say, that is false. That is a lie. And you need to repent. And if you're unwilling to repent, you got to go. You can't stay in this house. We love you, but you got to go. You got to go find anywhere else because this house is a house of truth. This house is God's house where we preach the word of God and the word of God only. So let me make that clear. John is referring to and talking to the life of the church. 
I'm not suggesting you go to your co-workers and you go to your neighbors and you tell them how sinful they are and how wrong they are and how contrary to the Word of God and that they're false teachers. I'm not suggesting you do that. Have conversations, build relationships, but within the confines of the church, within the church itself, it is our job and mandate to uphold the truth, not to accept whatever comes in. Let me just tell you this, God will never honor a house that allows habitual sin to go unnoticed or to go unaccounted for. Why? Because you and I, we're going to stand and give an account for everything that we've ever done. We're going to stand before Jesus and Jesus is going to say, tell me about that time. And you're going to say, I, I don't know. We're going to give an account. Therefore, if we're going to give an account on that day, it's our job, our responsibility, our mandate to hold each other accountable to the truth of Scripture. Because we're going to give an account one day. And in order to avoid giving an, an, an account for things that we can avoid here on this earth or we can prevent here on this earth, we need to do that. We need to hold each other to that standard, to that standard of holiness. Not this dogmatic pharisaical, I'm better than you are, but no, this is what the Word of God says, and I care for your soul, and I care for the condition of your heart, and this is what truth actually is, not what you're believing, not with this new belief system you're talking about, not this ideal, not this ide ideology that you're coming up with, this truth is whatever you want it to be. No, this is the standard of holiness. This is the standard of truth. This is the book by which we live our life. Every word, the whole counsel of God's word, we hold each other accountable to the truth that is found only in God and only through his word. And then John goes on in verse number three, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and in love. John's point simply is this, you cannot separate the truth from love. If you truly love somebody, you will present them with the truth. And if you present someone with the truth, that means that you truly love someone. You can't just avoid it because it may cause friction in someone's life. Let me give you an example. On a piece of duct tape, there are two sides to that piece of duct tape. There's the smooth side, and then there is the sticky side. Now imagine for, an, for just, just a moment with me that my hands represent the two smooth sides, right? Like you're in church, here's a smooth side of duct tape. Here's a smooth side of duct tape right here. You're kind of going around, you see somebody kind of rub up against them and you kind of just, you know, you rub up against them and you kind of go on your way. You're like, oh, hey, how you doing? Oh, that's cool. You're living that lifestyle. No problem. What's, oh, you're out there doing all that. Oh, no problem at all. You're over here doing this. It's contrary to the word of God, but ah, it's okay. Cool. High five. Now slide right off and you go about your way, right? And there's no truth. There's no accountability whatsoever. Now, imagine with me that my hands now are the sticky side of the duct tape, right? And you're kind of going about you see people in church you're talking you're communicating you hear prayer requests you see someone living a lifestyle that's kind of contrary to the word of god and now you go to them and you present them with the truth and now what happens like you're bonded right like, like now in order to come now there's friction right now there's stickiness now there's a bond that has happened there because oftentimes what happens with christians is we want to avoid that friction we want to avoid that bond we just want to kind of go our own way and kind of go and do our own thing but the moment the friction happens and the bond happens now you're bonded together now you got to fight to break free now you got to fight and you can break free right you may be able to tear each other apart or tear up uh, tear apart from each other but what's going to happen Happen. You may sever that bond. You may rip that tape. You may hurt that person, right? There's all these different things that happen. John's point is you can't be afraid of the friction. We can't afford not to bond ourselves together. We can't afford not to speak the truth to each other. We can't allow our hospitality and our love to come and compromise the sake and the, and the cause of truth. We can't allow that to happen. Otherwise, we're not a church. We're just simply Simply a social club. Let me be clear here at our church. We have an open door policy, which means anybody and everybody from every and any walk of life is welcome to walk through our doors. But just because we have an open door policy does not mean that we are accepting of the sin that is in your life because Jesus is not accepting of the sin in your life. It has to be dealt with clearly. All are welcome. And I tell you this, we are not going to dogmatically and pharisaically judge any single 
single person, but we're going to invite all into our doors to experiencing the to experience the life transforming power of Jesus. That as Jesus changes their heart, so too will their behavior change. So too will the lifestyle change. So too will their from the inside out begin to change. Our open door policy is not a sign of acceptance of any kind of sin in people's life. Again, we are not going to dogmatically judge people, but we're going to welcome you into the presence of God to experience the life transforming power of God that has the power to change your heart and to begin to change your life and change your world. This is what it means. We uphold the truth. We're not going to buy our hospitality and buy our acceptance. Just accept the the sin that is in your life or accept the lifestyle that you choose to live. No, we're going to say, this is what the word of God says. This is what the truth of God says. You can accept it and you can, or you can deny it. Listen, but if you deny it, that's cool, right? You can still be part of our church, but if you begin preaching your denial, if you begin preaching these things that are false and contrary to the word of God, you got to go. You got to go find anywhere else because it's not going to stand in this house. This is John's point. He's saying that to the lady, lady, your hospitality is causing a lot of confusion, right? Because you're you're welcoming in these false teachers that are preaching a gospel that is totally not the gospel at all. Lady, you got to stop it because by just by simply associating with them, you are confusing new believers, you're confusing mature believers, and you're causing this different gospel to go forth into this church and into the churches in the region, and you got to stop. All right, let's go on. Verse number four, John says this, it has given me great joy. So John's still talking to the lady. This is a personal letter to the lady in the church. It's given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. <laughs> it almost sounds like a backhanded compliment. Like, hey, you're a great mom. Minus those two kids right over there. Those two, eh, it kind of sounds like this backhanded compliment, right? Just as the father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing to you a new command, but one that you have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. This is kind of like classic church leadership, right? Like, like a, a leader goes to confront someone in the church or confront another leader in the church and you kind of like butter them up like, oh man, you're doing an awesome job. I really appreciate how you led this way or how you did this. But here's a few things you can work on. It kind of sounds like that, right? Like the point is this, the, the, the point John is making is this, that in order to walk in the commands of God, to walk in the obedience of the commands of God means this, that in order to truly love somebody, you have to confront them with the truth and not just confrontationally confront them, but constantly be speaking the truth to people. That's when you know you're walking in the commands of God. That's when you know you're walking in the truth of God is that you're not afraid to speak the truth of scripture. Now I understand. I totally get it that there are things in scripture that are contrary to our culture today, right? There are things that are, that fly in the face of of politics. There are things that fly in the face of normal, what we would say normal lifestyles today, where there are things that fly in the face. But in order to truly love people, you cannot be afraid to speak the truth of what scripture says. This is what John, this is the point John is making to the lady. You have separated truth and love and you're, and you are saying that you're loving people by welcoming them into your home, but you're not truly loving them. You're enabling them to continue preaching the false gospel. And in so doing, you are leading your part of the ministry, their ministry that is leading people away from the truth of scripture. And it's wrong and it's wicked. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read verses 7 to 13. This is really the meat of what John is about to say. And there's four big ideas that John gives that John's going to lay out for us. The first big idea is this, is that deception and heresy is everywhere. And you say, yeah, duh, everybody knows that. But, it, but, but do we really live that way? Do we really live with this mentality? That, like John says in 1 John, test everything. Do we really live with the idea that deception is everywhere and it comes in all forms and all shapes and all sizes that could easily lead me astray, right? If, if presented in the right package, I may be like, wow, I never thought about it that way. Oh, I've never thought about the, I've never thought about it. And you can easily find yourself. I've been there, right? Like I've been where I've been. I've sat in a, under a sermon. I've sat under a teaching. I've viewed a, a YouTube video and I've been like, wow, wow. How did they, how did God reveal that to them and nobody else in the world, right? Like I've been there before where it's very easy to fall victim to that mentality. Let's read it. Verse number seven. 
first part of verse 7, John says this, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge that Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Listen, if I can be honest with you, here's one of my frustrations as a pastor, is that we live in a day when no churches want to spiritually discriminate because we live in a culture that neutralizes truth. And as a result of that, no one wants to be dogmatic or claim anything worthwhile at all. Let me be clear in this place. Let me be clear today that we definitively and dogmatically stand upon and stand in and stand in the truth of God's word. Everything, every word, it says every syllable, every chapter, every phrase, we stand with the Word of God. We stand on the Word of God, and we believe that it is the light unto our path and the lamp unto our feet. It is our guidebook. It is our love letter. It is the way It is the way by which we live our lives, and we will only ever preach the Word of God in this church. We will never say or stand against anything that the Word of God stands for. We will stand with the Word of God until the day we die or until the day Jesus comes back. But we live in this day when everyone neutralizes truth, and truth is whatever you want it to be, even if it flies in the face of what Scripture says dogmatically and definitively, even if it flies in the face of that, we stand with the Word of God, and we do not neutralize truth, and we spiritually discriminate. If you are against the Word of God, you are not part of this house. If you spiritually are not in a place of accepting the whole counsel of God's word and it requires that you answer that question, are you for the word of God? Are you, do you believe the whole counsel of God's word? We say that all the time in this church. Do you affirm the whole counsel of God's word? And if your answer is yes, awesome. You have a place in this church. And I'm not saying that we're, 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 we're that our doors aren't open to everybody. But what I am saying is that if you deny the truth of Scripture and you begin preaching that or talking about that with people in our church, number one, you got to repent. Number two, you got to go. Right? You either repent and you get your life right and you come in alignment with the word of God or two, you have to go. Go anywhere else. Right? I'll go find somewhere else that will support your belief system. I hate that for you personally, but you still got to go. Second big idea that John gives is this, is that deceivers and heretics share the fate of the Antichrist. I'm going to read the second half of verse 7 and the first half of verse 9. It'll be on the screen for us. Uh, it says this, Any such person person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Now that phrase, the Antichrist, doesn't refer to the one world ruler. It's referring to the, the ESV translates it. Uh, the Antichrist, but it could be better translated an Antichrist, right? So like a a false uh, prophet, a false teacher. So not the Antichrist, but they share the faith. They're they're a false teacher. Verse 9, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Listen, if a person is wrong about Jesus Christ, they are wrong about everything. If they don't know who Jesus actually is, if they've not had a revel, a, a revelatory, a powerful experience in Jesus Christ, then they don't know who Christ actually is. The best way to determine a false teacher is to ask them who Jesus is to them, right? And if their answer is anything like, um, oh, he's a great man. He was a moral man. He was a good man. He was a great historical figure. He loved people. He accepted everybody. If that's their answer, and their answer is not, he is Messiah. He is Lord. He is my Savior. He is God, very God, put on flesh, walked among us, lived a perfect life, died, rose again, and seated at the right hand of God. If their answer is anything other than that, then they are a false teacher. So they are a false prophet. Let me just add this. False teachers and false teaching and false prophets, and you call them whatever you want to call them, they don't just hold microphones and stand in pulpits. They walk among us. Again, First John is very clear that they walk among us. They are part of our churches. They hang out in our grid groups. They share life with us. And you have to be so knowledgeable in the Word of God that when you have these conversations, you, begin, you can begin picking up on things and you're like, that's not actually Scripture. That's not actually in the Word of God. And you begin questioning them about it. You begin calling them out on it. And if, and if their teaching is exposed, again, they have to repent And they have to come into alignment with the Word of God or you have to tell them to go. You got to get out. of You can't spread this in our church because we're for the Word of God. And for the Word of God only, they share the fate of the Antichrist. If they don't have Jesus Christ, they're done. They, 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 They share the fate of the Antichrist. They are a false prophet and they will share in the same fate as the the ultimate false prophet. The third big idea is that is this part of your heavenly reward will be determined by how you guarded the truth. This is big. 
This is huge. Part of your heavenly reward. There, there is a reward waiting for you in heaven. My goal is not just to make it to heaven. Right? I don't, I don't want to just make it there. I want to experience the full extent of God's reward that he has for me in heaven. And part of that reward will be determined by how I guarded, how I preached, how I confronted people with the truth. Look at it. Verse number eight. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Verse 9, second half. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. I I've said this before. Heaven is going to be wonderful for everybody. However, heaven will not be the same for everybody. When you and I get to heaven, we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, not to determine our salvation, not to determine if we get to stay there or if we don't get to stay there. It's not about our salvation. It's about how we used our salvation to advance the kingdom of God on this earth. And part of the way we advance the kingdom of God is by upholding to the truth, upholding the truth, speaking the truth, even when it hurts, even when it confronts people, even when it causes friction, even when people are beginning to speak, uh, speak lies eyes about the Word of God? Are we able to adequately, fervently uphold the truth, confront the truth, speak the truth, even in the midst of those lies? This is part of our heavenly reward. It will be determined by how we guarded the Word of God, how we guarded the truth that is in us, how we guarded this truth. This is not just, I mean, this drives me to my knees Every time I get up to preach, every time I, I get up to share the word of God, every time I have a coffee with somebody, every time I have an interaction with somebody, this drives me to my knees saying, God, dear God, dear God, bring me to a place where my life is founded upon your word. I don't want there to be anything in my life that is contrary to your word. I want to be able to adequately communicate the truth of scripture to anybody I come in contact with because I want to experience the full extent that God has for me waiting in heaven. And part of my reward, part Part of your reward. It's not just a preacher's thing. This is your, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, if you have a relationship and you claim to have um, a foundation in and on the word of God, this is your responsibility. This is part of your reward. It will be determined by how you uphold the truth of scripture. The fourth and the final big idea John gives us is that hospitality of heresy and deception, it's wicked. It's evil. Look at it, verse number 10. John says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house. So this is John talking to the lady who is now welcoming in these false teachers. She's welcoming, hey, I know you're preaching false uh, false doctrine, but you can come on in and you can rest here, you can eat, you can rejuvenate, regain your strength, and you can go back out and you can keep on preaching. So this is John's warning, do not take them into your house or even welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. You have a part if you're enabling, if you're accepting, if you're silently ignoring, if you're openly welcoming welcoming them into your home and welcoming those, those lies into your home. Not, not having conversation, but welcoming them, welcoming them into your home and into your life. You share in their wicked work. Listen, let me just say this, that there are many doctrines in the Bible that can be left open to interpretation and debate. But when it comes to the doctrine of who Christ is in our life, there is no latitude. There's no room for debate or error at all. I mean, there, there is Jesus Christ is God, very God. That, that's who Jesus is, was. He, was, he is Messiah, he is Savior, he is Lord of all, King of kings, this is who Christ is. So the doctrines that are by, I'm not talking about having this unloving attitude toward false teachers. I'm not talking about being unloving towards a heretic. I'm talking about decisively dealing with error. It has to be dealt with decisively. If there is ever any error in someone, it is your job. It's my job. If they are a believer, I'm not talking about non-believers. I'm talking about believers now. If there is error and they are talking things, it's your job. It's your mandate. It's your responsibility to hold them accountable to the word of God. When Christians deviate from the truth, they defect from God who is truth. God is love. God is truth. And if you violate the truth, you violate your relationship with God, plain and simply. Let's go on. Let's read verses 12 and 13 here, and we'll wrap it up with this. John says, I have much to write to you, <laughs> but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who was chosen by God, send you their greetings. I find this really intriguing, right? Because like uh, John could have used this letter to talk about, you know, 
big things, right? Like church budget, community events, outreach opportunities, house giving, house attendance. He could have used a letter to talk about anything in the church. And yet he uses this letter, a book in our Bible, to talk about the most important thing, and that is truth. That is the love of God. How love and truth cannot be separated from each other. To love someone is to speak truth. To speak truth to someone is to truly love them. Listen, there are a thousand things that will take our attention. Noble things, ministry-related things, community events, things that make a difference in our community. But at the basic level of Christianity, if we defect from God, if we defect from the truth, ultimately we defect from our eternities and have the potential to destroy our own eternity and the other, and other people's eternities that we come in contact with. May we be faithful to the Word of God. May we be faithful to truth and love and how they can't be separated. May we be faithful to God. Amen. Let's pray together today. Father, I love you. I do thank you for your word, God. I thank you that you you give us uh, the, the, the guidebook for our life. There's no question about it. We can go to your word and your word has something to say about every aspect of our life. And we're so grateful for that. You know, maybe today you're watching online and you say, Pastor, here's my reality. At one time in my life, I would say that I was walking with the Lord. I had a relationship. I accepted it in my life. But I've gotten to this place where I've allowed other, other truths to come in, other lies to come in. And I have this now this belief system that is totally wonky. Some parts are mixed in with Scripture. Other parts aren't. And it's just very confusing. And I'm now at a place where I don't even know that I'm walking with the Lord. Maybe for you, there's never been a moment when you've given your life to Jesus and you've made him the Lord of all in your life. I want to give you that chance today. I'm going to pray a prayer. The Bible says that if you pray this prayer, you believe it in your heart, you confess it with your mouth, then you are a child of the living God. So all together, would you say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you in my life. I ask that you come into my heart. Forgive me of all of my sin. Free me. And fill me with your spirit. I am chosen. I'm committed to your truth. The truth of scripture. I'm your child now and forever. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You're so grateful that you decided to pray that prayer today. Let me say a couple things. Number one, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or for the millionth time, that's awesome. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome back to the family of God. If you have yet to be baptized after making this decision, maybe you've prayed that prayer before and you've never been baptized. Maybe for you, you prayed it for the first time today. Awesome. We want you to be baptized because scripture says this, repent you did that. That's awesome. The second step is be baptized. Repent and be baptized. So if you have yet to be baptized, let us know. We want to baptize you. We will do it in the lake. We'll fill up a bathtub. We'll go to a hotel. We'll go to your home. We'll do it anywhere. Anywhere there's a body of water, we will make it happen. We want you to be baptized and walk in that experience, walk in that obedience. Also got some info down below. Maybe you're asking that question. Cool. That's awesome. I prayed. But what do I do now? We, we want to help walk that journey with you. Text in that number, what now, to 75787. We'll connect you with people in our church that have walked this journey that can answer any questions you may have. But I'm incredibly thrilled you made that decision today. Hey, it's a, it's a great day to be in church. If you're a first-time guest of ours, welcome. Glad you're on the link with us. Info down below. We'd love to hear your story, connect with you, share a little bit of our story, and reach the city together a neighborhood at a time. This Thursday, we've got a great worship night at our venue at the Donk House. It's going to be on the sixth floor, outdoor terrace. So bring a little, you know, probably a little hoodie or something. We're going to be outside on the, out, on, the, on the rooftop, looking downtown. It's going to be awesome. So come join us. 7 p.m. at the Donk House. It's going to be a powerful night of worship. We're out on the street every single week, every Sunday, every other Monday, reaching our, our homeless brothers and sisters. Come make a difference. Info down below for you to get plugged in and get involved. And lastly, thank you for being a generous church. And thank you for your giving and your generosity and your tithing and your offering and in your missions giving. It truly makes a difference. God says, be faithful in your tithe, right? 10%, that belongs to God. Everything above and beyond that goes to uh, offerings or missions or community events or just to help um, our community out or across the globe, actually, as well. So 
want to say thank you. Info down below for you to keep on being faithful, your tithing and your offering. Are you glad to be in church today? Glad to be online? I hope you are. I had a great time hanging with you today online. And I'd say this, I'd encourage you, if you are comfortable rejoining your church family, come rejoin us back every Sunday. It's been awesome to see our crowd grow, the church kind of come back into community through grid groups and through Sunday morning experience and through worship nights and through outreach. It's been awesome. Don't do life alone. If you're not plugged into a church, come join our church. If you're kind of sick of watching a screen, come join church. We are safe. We are secure. We're following all the mandates and all the CDC guidelines. So you, we've got a safe place you can come for your kids and for adults as well. So thank you. Grateful for you. Have a great week. We love you. We pray for you. And we'll see you back here on the link or live and in person next Sunday, 11 a.m. Have an awesome week, great fam.